This is an interview with, uh, with Jim Finch. Uh, my name is Eric Weidenhammer. We're, uh, we're in Toronto. Um, so maybe we can begin with just the, the basic questions. Uh, could you, could you uh, give us your name and age? My name is uh, James uh, Finch, uh, commonly referred to as Jim Finch, and uh, I'll be 68 next month. Where were you born? I was born in Birmingham in uh, England, the United Kingdom. Yeah. What did your What did your parents do? Uh, well, for most of the time that I can remember, Mum was was a housewife, but uh, she was uh, a secretary before uh, for a period of times while I was while I was growing up. So she was a secretary. My father worked for uh, for, for a wood distribution company, timber. He was a timber merchant, timber salesman. Uh, as a child, what did you do to pass the time? <laughs> what did I do to pass the time, well, other than being at school, etc. But, um, well, a memory is playing outdoors a lot. I mean, uh, you, you often hear that being discussed right now, you know, since kids watch videos or there's more, uh, more concerns about kids playing outside. But uh, it was, would be an exaggeration to say they kicked you out at nine in the morning and told you to come back when it got dark. But it was along those lines. We spent a lot of time outside of school, a lot of time outside playing with, playing with friends. So we were not far from uh, what was known as Autry Lane. It was a very countrified area. Uh, not so much now, but uh, certainly was then. And so there's a lot of opportunities to play in the country, you know, effectively in the country. Did you uh, have an early interest in the world of science or engineering? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that that was a... Uh, I mean, I guess at, at school I was always okay at, uh, at, at the mathematics and physics and chemistry. Um, I didn't, for casual reading, I probably uh, did more reading in history than I did, <laughs> did in science. But I, I was always fascinated by biographies. Uh, it didn't really matter what field they were in. They could have been biographies of film stars, they could have been biographies of the military figures, um, and certainly they included biographies of uh, figures in the science world. It was always a question to me of uh, what, what distinguished them, what made them tick, how did they get to where they were. I wouldn't say I was trying to model it on that, but I was always fascinated by how people got to where they were, and so these uh, yeah, biographies were something I always enjoyed. Still do. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, your early education and uh, where you went to school? I went to school in uh, Church of England Primary School, uh, which was, um, well, you, you walked to school and walked home for lunch. And, uh, it would have been about, a, I guess, 15, 20 minutes walk from where I was. Um, yeah, it, it was a typical education for somebody in the UK at that time. The big, the big feature was that you had to uh, be prepared for what was referred to as the 11 plus. This was a very dramatic uh, exam uh, and the results of that exam you either went to grammar school uh, or you went to, let's refer to them as they were then as secondary modern schools where you'd be more expected to do trades. Uh, but I did pass the 11, the 11 plus after uh, this, a lot of anxiety. Um, and we did, I did get to uh, what was referred to then, and there were a few still left in England, uh, a grammar school. And uh, the training there was expecting you might go to a university, that would be the, uh, the expectation at the end of that. Where did you go to university? I went to the University of uh, Birmingham in my hometown. Um, there were several reasons why that was chosen. It was very common uh, in England uh, to go to a different city for, for, for university, but there were reasons to, uh, to study. Did you, uh, were there any classes or subjects that you particularly liked or disliked? Why? Well, are we talking of undergraduate or are we talking of high school? Uh, how about undergraduate? Well, I might go back and, and say one of the sure. things I, I enjoyed uh, towards the end of my uh, time at, at high school, grammar school, was, uh, was, was courses in geology. Uh, they had somebody that came in, uh, it was in a sense part of the curriculum that we didn't have to pass or take geology, but it was offered uh, because the, the uh, staff member was interested and I enjoyed that. And I think that built on uh, a long interest in uh, geography, 
which, which was probably my favourite subject all the way through. Uh, I was recognised I wasn't going to get much further with geography, so of course one wanted to do maths and physics in order to get, get a job. But in terms of uh, what interested me at school, geography and history were two things, and geography morphed into geology, so it was quite a, quite a comfortable connection there. Um, what brought you to Canada? Well, uh, I mean, it, it, I probably would have asked the questions a little more what took me into the department I was in, because through that department is really where the story starts to unfold. Okay. It's the, uh, the reasons that I, that I uh, went to uh, the Department of Mineral Engineering uh, at the University of Birmingham was partly because they did in fact send a flyer around, so that was the first time I'd ever heard of this particular subject. But not knowing much about it, I actually uh, applied to uh, do geology. And uh, when I went, as you did in England, you went to an interview uh, at the university and you were interviewed by somebody in the geology department. You rather cryptically asked um, uh, how my feet were, which, well, that's, it's funny you should mention that because I, you know, I do get blisters very easily. It was one of those features of uh, the Finch family that we always got, we blistered very easily if we went for a long walk. And he says, oh, well, you know, the only job you're going to get is traipsing the Arabian desert looking for oil. So I said, well, you know, that obviously doesn't sound too attractive to me. He said, why don't you walk up the, uh, the hill? And it was, it was a, short, a short walk up the hill. I go to the mineral engineering department. They do a lot of geology, but you get a job. I said, well, I always, I always thanked him. I can't remember his name now, of course, after all these years. But I always thanked that individual for being uh, up front. He probably had some... Gripe <laughs> that he was that he was venting on me, but I was was grateful for that, uh, and so I went up to the Department of uh, Mineral Engineering. You enjoyed the program. I enjoyed the program. Uh, I enjoyed the first person I met because he wasn't expecting me, so he was in the middle of, a, of an experiment. He was leaning over this, uh, well, let's call it a tank, a small tank, and he was scraping things off the top. Uh, Turned out he was doing a flotation experiment and he was only marginally interested in me at this time. He was quite fascinated by what he could see going on and he had a big shock of hair. And I thought, wow, well, this. Uh, no, I was made very welcome there. Uh, it was a small program. Uh, there were only 20 of us, 24, I think, uh, started the program. Um, we did a lot of courses in chemical engineering, but there there was 124. So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the program. And one of the things they did was get you summer employment. So I, I did work one uh, summer in the UK, in, uh, it would have been, if you option, I guess that would have been 68, uh, 67. And then in 1968, yes, 1968, they uh, arranged for me to work in Northern Australia, a place called Mount Isa, Mount Isa Mines, famous in, in our business, Mount Isa Mines. And uh, well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I mean, that was just a fascinating. Suddenly, so that you know, the, the world was was opening up. You know, you're what you're 19, 20 years old, and, and I, uh, I enjoyed that immensely. So it sort of comes back to you're asking why Canada, because when I got back to the UK, having seen Australia, I was keen to see other parts of the world, and uh, uh, perhaps it was part of me didn't want to stay in Birmingham either. You know, wanted to see other things. So I, I applied to um, several universities, but not back in Australia. Maybe one or two, but I was looking uh, perhaps a bit closer to home. That probably might have been a factor, but I looked for, for schools in North America, the United States, and, and Canada. And the only one that replied with a personal letter from the chairman of the department, uh, the late Bill Williams, uh, that was the only one was from McGill University. So I really didn't look beyond that. I thought that was, uh, that was uh, you know, a personal touch there. I thought, uh, even at my age, you know, I appreciated that. In fact, somebody from the department, uh, Gordon Smith, who's actually here at this meeting, uh, he came over and interviewed me. So they made they made efforts to attract me, and I was certainly very keen uh, to uh, to broaden my uh, outlook on the world and uh, travel to uh, travel to Canada. Yeah. Did you enjoy Montreal? Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, I would always say England promises summer and never delivers. Uh, it promises winter, doesn't deliver that either. Montreal delivered both in spades, and uh, I actually enjoyed the winters more than the summers. The summers, humid and hot, was really not 
very pleasant for me and my feet blistered, remember? So <laughs> that, was, that was a combination that I didn't enjoy. But the winters, uh, we, we were from around the world. The, the guy who showed me how to cross-country ski was from New Zealand. Uh, and there were people from South Africa, there were people from, of course, Canada, the United States, Ireland was another, and Scotland. So we, um, yeah, we got on very well. So there was a good social life and uh, the, the program uh, was good. I was given a lot of freedom for, for my PhD work and, and I appreciated that. How did you choose your PhD work and, and what was it in? Well, the, my undergraduate program, of all the things that we did, all the, the topics that we covered, mineral processing was the one that I found the most attractive. Uh, you know, we did pyro, we did hydro, and we did uh, ceramics and various uh, other aspects that could be broadly classified under metallurgical engineering. But really, to me, the, the one series of topics, uh, subjects, was in mineral processing was the ones that attracted me. So my desire was to do a PhD in, in, in mineral processing. Whatever whatever they whatever they, they gave me as a task, you know, I would be quite happy to look at that. And I did work for Gordon Smith and he worked in flotation, so we started uh, in flotation. How did that lead to, to your first job in Canada? Well, I've been at the university ever since. I arrived there in 1969 and I, I got a master's degree in 71 and a PhD in 73. And uh, Bill Williams, uh, the, the guy who, uh, the, the prof had written to me with the personal letter, we were still, still getting on very well. And uh, he'd seen what I was capable of doing and uh, he offered me a job at, at McGill. I had a job offer at the University of New South Wales as well. So it was a... Uh, an interesting choice, but I, you know, people said, well, why don't you move? I said, well, I made a big move coming from England to Canada. I don't necessarily have to prove I, <laughs> I can move yet again. So the idea of continuing work at uh, McGill, they offered me a couple of very interesting courses to cover. Um, and I got married at this point. My wife was, was working as a physiotherapist in the local hospital. It, it was a, a good match. So uh, I said yes. and. Um, yeah, I've never worked anywhere else. <laughs> so it's a very natural transition from graduate work and then into uh, to teaching. Yeah, and, you know, we're talking the late 60s, early 70s, so uh, programs were trying to expand. Uh, and uh, so in that regard, it was perhaps a little easier to, to find employment uh, as a young professor um, because the universities were looking for people to, to build their programs. Um. Do you tell us about some of the uh, industrial workplaces that you were involved with through your academic work? Well, I, I'd have to go back and say uh, Bill Williams was, was a big help here. Uh, he knew that I'd uh, I satisfied the requirements as far as uh, research potential at least. And uh, you know, I'd already published uh, four or five papers at this, at, this, at this juncture, which is what he noticed. Um, but in 1974, he arranged for me to work at Pine Point Mines uh, in the Northwest Territories on Great Slate Lake uh, through his contacts at uh, Kaminka. And, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, in 1975, I worked for Kaminka again, but at the Sullivan Concentrator in British Columbia. And then in 1977, I went back to Pine Point Mines. We typically would work for three months. Uh, the university didn't seem to mind. Um, I think it's much more difficult to do that sort of thing now. Nobody made me sign confidentiality agreements or anything. And I would literally disappear towards the middle of May and come back uh, end of August, beginning of September. So um, I enjoyed that uh, ability to get out there and, uh, and, and work, work in industry. They would give me projects to do, but I'd also end up you know, working as a general engineer on the floor. So I went back in 77 and uh, I went back in uh, 1981. Um, yeah, all Pine Point Mines was a big, big component of the industrial experience that I've been able to bring to the classroom. And what did they do at, uh, what, what sort of mine was this? Let's see. In fact, I believe, if I remember the big sign as we uh, went to work every morning, it was the, it was the largest open pit lead zinc mine in the world at that, uh, at that time. And, uh, yeah, so a lot of a um, lot of people worked there. A lot of people came through there. So a good opportunity to learn uh, the basics of uh, industrial mineral processing as opposed to research mineral processing. Did you notice any differences between the academic and the industrial work environment? 
Oh, well, yes. I mean, I think when we started back in the 60s, early 70s, there was probably suspicion is perhaps too strong a word, but I, you got the sense that the, the industrial uh, industrial people really didn't think there was much, you know, uh, you, you had some basic training, but really the, the army job training was what was important. Um, and I think it was, it, was, it was difficult for me to, to, uh, to raise research funds at the, in, in those days. So they didn't seem to see that there was much value in industrial money going into academic university research. That, that has changed, uh, but that was the sense I had then that um, yes, you need to train undergraduates, but the research career that you want, what's the link to industry? I think we've we've worked on that, and we've been reasonably successful at working at that, at that interface. But there was a sense of a division, at the, certainly at the time, that we didn't have much to offer in, in terms of research. You know. Did you often travel uh, for work and experience other academic or professional cultures? Well, there was an opportunity for uh, sabbatical. There was a lot of a lot of travelling as I got more involved in industrial, uh, I'd say contract work, but it was all done through the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. There was these collaborative and research groups. There's a lot of travel associated with that. Uh, you know, practically every year for I don't know how many years. You know, you'd go to Winnipeg and then up to uh, up to up to Thompson and over to Flintstone and do these sorts of trips and. Uh, I had to try it in British Columbia. Uh, that, that was a that was a common common trip. In terms of other academic uh, uh, experiences and interactions, uh, I had a sabbatical at the University of Leeds back in the in the UK in nineteen eighty one, uh, and then I've had two sabbaticals since then, which certainly have had an impact because I've really enjoyed working there. Is at the Julius Crutchley Mineral Research Institute uh, in Brisbane, in Australia. Um, I first went there as a student in 1968 because I met people doing their PhDs who were at the JK because uh, I carried their buckets. Uh, that, was, that was my introduction to mineral process and research, was carrying buckets for these individuals who were doing their research. But they invited me down to Brisbane and I went down to uh, uh, be shown around the JK. So I've had a long um, association, a long interaction with, uh, with the JK, but I'm very well with their director, uh, Alvin Lynch, who's uh, retired now. Uh, so I went there for a sabbatical in 93, uh, and I uh, went there again in 2010. And um, yeah, that's been a, a highlight of my interactions in terms of the academic uh, career, was uh, interactions with the JK. Circumstances are different in Australia. Is, is, the, is the work culture different, or do you find similarities? Well, I don't think I was there long enough to, to get other than a you know a superficial sense. Uh, it, it did seem as if the student salaries and stipends were a lot higher in Australia than they are in uh, in Canada. And uh, you know that that that's a plus and a plus and a plus and a minus really. Um, uh, yeah, that 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 was certainly one big difference. The thing that I learned at the JK uh, was the uh, they had really shown the way as to how you can make industrial type research uh, valid both academically as well as of course having some practical output. I mean, to me, they were the leaders in, in making that uh, making that uh, that link, and um, I wouldn't say I you know I'm, I'm, well I borrowed from that. I, I could see what they were doing, and I could see that that was. Uh, very valid way for for a researcher in the minerals business, in the engineering business, to uh, to make a mark. What sort of steps were they taking that uh, you thought could be implemented in Canada or better implemented in Canada? Well, they their research money largely uh, seemed to me to come through AMIRA, the Australian uh, Minerals Industries Research Association. It's now AMIRA International. It's it's, it's gone international. But that seemed to be a very successful uh, vehicle. It was uh, designed to bring together industrial need with research potential, uh, research uh, deliverables. And um, Canada didn't really have anything quite like that. Um, I mean, in the early 80s, the, the uh, Natural Science, NSERC, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, they created strategic grants uh, which were sort of longer term, uh, but now the money is starting to get a little bit more substantial.
And then they developed these collaborative research and development grants, which were aimed at getting industry partnerships uh, to work with the universities. That's not quite the Amara model, but you can see it's sort of heading in that direction. And then in the early uh, 90s, I forget now the acronym for the first one, but it's the, uh, the current, um, we have these consortia, and I'm struggling, <laughs> struggling to remember what the original name was. Um, Camero is the current name, Canadian Industries Mental Research Organization. I think it's been that way for about 10 or 15 years. So that is close to the model of Amira. So I, I won't say I had any involvement in making that uh, connection, but I think people noticed what was going on in Australia and saw that as a potentially useful uh, and valuable model for delivering research dollars to uh, and bringing research industry money together with uh, research deliverers. So, yeah, I think that was something we learned from the Australians. We didn't. We didn't create the same level of salaries that they did in Australia, so I think whether that's good or bad depends on which way you're looking at it. <laughs> what sorts of uh, social activities were you involved with uh, at work or after work with your co-workers? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the environment was such that we, we did a lot of uh, outside activities together. You know, we, we were uh, we were work colleagues, but uh, we weren't. Uh, you know, I played golf with a couple of guys who have long since retired. Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, when when I when I uh, in retirement, I've made far more <laughs> far more friends that were never anything to do with anything that I had as a background from from, from business. So uh, no, I don't think that the uh, the, the social side was a particularly significant component of my, of my work career. Well, we had Christmas parties and we had you know, the usual things, but uh, uh, I've often wondered about that. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, that's, yeah, I don't know how common that is, but certainly in my experience, that was the way it worked. So, I guess this question would pertain to uh, both the professors and the students. Um, did you notice uh, social problems like drug, alcohol abuse, infidelity, or or abuse problems in your line of work? Standard question. Standard question? Well, I mean, I, my wife would be the first to say, but I'd have to agree with her that I can walk through life and not notice any of these things. Um, and of course, they do come across your desk occasionally. I mean, in my uh, involvement with, with students, I, I, I can't right now think of any examples of uh, students certainly not well, you know, medical problems that have made them Force them out of the program, but I can't remember anything that was related to. Well, it's, it's certainly not been a big component of what I've run into, mm. either from colleagues or students. <laughs> Could you uh, describe the variety of topics that you've uh, studied in your academic research? Some of the range of, uh, of, of issues that you've studied? Well, I, I think. In many respects, quite broad. Um, the, the research work I did with, uh, with with Gordon with Gordon Smith that was very uh, fundamental work on measuring service tension and absorption rates, and uh, we made links to uh, to flotation observations that we'd made. The first uh, big research area I got into that was magnetic separation. Um, there was a topic I kept reading about it called high gradient magnetic separation and I struggled to understand exactly what the configurations were that were doing this and um, eventually realized what they were doing and at a conference actually a conf uh, an AIRE conference American Institute of Mining uh, Engineering in Dallas we met people from the, the National Bitter Magnet Labs in, in MIT and uh, we went down to see what they were doing. They were the guys who were promoting this high gradient magnetic uh, work for their own physics reasons, not, not, uh, not mineral processing, although they recognize now that there was a potential application. They were actually searching for magnetic monopoles and they figured the way to do it is to, uh, is to lower this magnet that they designed off the boat in 
the Caribbean and dredge the mud <laughs> and see if they could find a monopole. And in doing that, of course, they realized they were actually separating one component from another that could have mineral processing applications. So for a dollar, they sold me their uh, superconducting uh, magnet and we brought it up to McGill. So we were able, with the physics department at McGill, to set up, you know, certainly in mineral processing research in Canada, I think, would have been the first superconducting high gradient <laughs> magnetic separator. So that was the first we did. And we graduated about five or six uh, master's students and at least one or two PhDs on that topic. Then the, the next, so that was, a, that was an, an interesting topic, I wanted to know about it. And then I started reading about what was referred to as column flotation. And uh, this was a Canadian development, uh, in fact, the Column Company of Canada was in Dorval. And again, so what, what exactly is this compared to, you know, conventional uh, flotation? And uh, so we got involved in that, uh, Miranda, uh, just put in really, let's say, the first commercial columns at Lenin Gaspé. They had the, this problem at about 14 cleaning stages for Molly. And they were able to reduce that to three or four stages, and the Molly recovery went up, and everything, you know, this is fantastic. It was a breakthrough technology for, for them. Nothing like having your backs against the wall, you know, to, to, to come up with something new. So then uh, we proposed to them. How to scale up, you know, what to do in order to, what lab test would you do, what test would you, what would you measure to try to scale this up. And that was uh, the start of uh, work with Miranda Research Centre, the Miranda Technology Centre as it became. And they provided the, the research funds and my scholarship for, uh, for, uh, for Glenn Dobby. And uh, Glenn Dobby and I worked on column flotation for the next five, ten years, and wrote a book. Uh, came out in 1990 on column flotation and he, uh, he set up his own company uh, which initially was, uh, was, was working in the sizing and, and uh, selling of column. So that, uh, that, that was, that was uh, an interest there in the, in the machines. Then in the, the mid, mid 80s there was a lot of interest in electrochemistry, the electrochemistry of flotation. So again, you know, you say, what on earth is this? You know, you've heard of electrochemistry, but here it's being applied to, uh, to mineral processing. That was actually, from, a, from an understanding point of view, it was one of the, the toughest things I, I tried to get into to see if I could do some research in, in, in that area. Um, and we, uh, we got some money, uh, one of these strategic plants, and we were able to hire a, 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 a quite a senior guy, really. He was, he was older than me, but he came with this with this strength in fundamental chemistry. He was a physical chemist, and so we were able to get into this electrochemistry. And so that that kept me another you know, ten years of, of research work uh, in that. But in, in, in between times, one of the things I, I, I found when I was working at uh, uh, Pine Point, but, and as we've learned again this morning, you know, the, 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 the grinding or comminution step is key to, uh, it, it's to prepare the material for separation, so uh, that's, you know, that's its part of it. And I would notice, as many had before, that when you looked at the individual minerals in the streams coming in, they were very different in, in particle size distribution. So we started asking questions as to whether this was differences in their softness, differences in their grindability. Uh, but in fact, it turns out that one of the biggest factors is their differences in density, because part of the, the process is to classify using effectively their settling rates in water, called the hydrocyclone. So uh, we set about uh, developing, uh, you know, doing the sampling, making the measurements, there's a lot of uh, size by size, metal analysis, uh, and developed some very uh, simple uh, models of the grinding circuit uh, at Pine Point that quite clearly show where these differences were coming from. And it would resolve some, some questions people had in mind. You know, why is the lead kind always finer than the, uh, the zinc kind? Well, it's actually because of the difference in density. And so questions that uh, the operators would have, but it was nice to be able to provide fairly obvious answers, but nevertheless quite clear answers as to what these issues were. 
So we did quite a bit of work in, uh, in, in common ocean as well, uh, but always based upon the idea of trying to understand mineral behavior as opposed to just the, the average uh, behavior. Could you describe in just in layman's terms what uh, where flotation fits into the process of smelting and refining pyrometallurgy? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I get that. Uh, I get that question asked almost uh, every other day. You know, with, with mm -hmm. people that uh, you know, you know, socialise. Well, what did you do? You said, oh, you know, where did you spend most of your time? And he came known as Mr. Bubbles. You know, because that was, that was one of the features of that uh, process. So, where does it fit in? Well, we've got material in the ground, so you've got rocks. The rocks contain uh, valuable components, uh, literally valuable. I mean, there's always a monetary uh, association with this business. So the mine is going to extract the ore, going to extract the rocks with the valuable material in it. The mineral processor then is going to try to select the one mineral relative to another. So first of all, you have to break the material so that, you know, if you looked, you know, looked at a specimen, you'd see different particles would be different minerals. So they've been broken away from each other, liberated is the word. Now you've got to physically separate the one from the other. You know, you've broken them apart, but they're obviously still mixed. So now you've got to separate them apart. And the mineral processing is the art and science, if you will, of doing that by exploiting physical properties. Not going to break chemical bonds. It goes in as lead sulfide. It comes out as lead sulfide. But it'll go in with these particles. It might be five percent lead sulfide. But when you have finished separating that from the rest, it's going to be 80, 90 percent lead sulfide. And now you can afford to break chemical bonds using smelting and, 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 and hydrometallurgy. You can now put the chemicals, put the heat in and uh, break these bonds to get the metal out. So you've got the ore extraction, the mineral extraction, and then the, the metal extraction. And by far the most uh, versatile method of separating particles is by flotation. And it's versatile because by the choice of chemicals, you can alter the wettability of these particles. So uh, it's like mixing well, let me be a little careful making those analogies. But you've got particles which have different levels of wettability. And um, the analogy I was going to draw is if you try to mix flour into water, it's quite clear that it doesn't want to, you know, because this is a very hydrophobic material. So you've got to really work at it to get the water to wet it. So by putting chemicals in, I can make, let's go back to the lead sulfide, galena is the mineral name. I can make it reject water. So that now when I blow air bubbles past it, it'll cling to the air bubble and be brought to the top, literally float. Um, and so because you've got this ability to control the system through the chemicals that you use, it becomes a very versatile process. We developed the arguments over exact timing, it doesn't matter, but around about 1905 was when the first big process, industrial process went in in Australia uh, to recover, to begin with, sulfide metals. And then the, the process became so versatile, it's used for a multitude of different industrial non-sulfide minerals. Uh, and it's used in areas in bitumen recovery, uh, oil refinery waste uh, cleanup. You know, the, the droplets of oil will be floated out by attaching to, to air bubbles. So it started as a process uh, for mineral separation, uh, and it's been very successful and has broadened into other uh, separation processes that are, that are required. What are some of the challenges that you face in your work? Challenges, I mean, challenges. Well, you know, finding money is always a, always a challenge. I remember once you got on to, to this research grant train, <laughs> the, the, the issue was you know, the grant's going to run out next year, you know, I better get another one. <laughs> and so if you were successful, the thing kept growing. So managing the size of the group, uh, it's not a problem anymore at the time, but that was one of the things I, I noticed, that if you weren't careful, uh, 
just speaking individually, and um, the group would get so big, I really was very uncomfortable. Uh, we got up to 16 grad students at one point, and I was, I was rattled. I mean, this was, I couldn't keep track of what was going on. Now, some groups are a lot bigger, and some groups are a lot smaller, but that's what I, I noticed, was that trying to manage and balance the funding and the people, uh, you obviously didn't want to shrink to zero, but you didn't want to keep growing, and that was a, that was a feature that, uh, that I that I uh, came to uh, to appreciate how to do that, you know, to do that over the years, and uh, say no sometimes. <laughs> What's the most difficult project that you participated in? Ah, well, I'm going to have to say because I I just said this two weeks ago when they asked me to write the preface for this book uh, that that uh, I was you know, checking my emails about three or four years ago. I had a request from an old friend, uh, Barry Wills, uh, who had written really the classical textbook in mental processing, mental processing uh, technology, back in the 70s. And uh, he was looking for somebody that would help him, uh, in fact, largely do it, uh, take on the task of the eighth edition. And for, for reasons that at some point you know, I, I wondered why, I, I said yes. So um, that took me about two years. Uh, I was getting close to retirement, and I did plan to retire, so I already uh, let the group run down a little bit. We had a new staff member, so he was actually taking up a lot of the reins. The group's still big, but my direct uh, supervision numbers had gone down. But I still had the resources, I still had the contacts, I still had the people. So, uh, yeah, that was the biggest task I've taken up, was, uh, was, was writing that, uh, editing, writing, that book took me the best part of uh, uh, two years, um, and I, I, yeah, I'll probably have to say I, I don't, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> so if that's a measure of what was the most difficult, I think that's it. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> have you ever worked in a particularly dysfunctional job or organization? Well, at some point, you find most of these uh, organizations a bit uh, dysfunctional. I remember. Uh, McGill was going through a period in the in the nineties uh, when it was really a serious shortage of, 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 uh, of funding, uh, and so now everything was being looked at with a very close eye, uh, and life became uncomfortable. Uh, but we were not different from virtually any other university, and a lot of businesses were going through some tough times in those days. And the mining industry goes through those tough times, it seems, about every 15 to 20 years. They go through really tough times. So I can't, uh, can't never complain about that. Uh, uh, the, the job at the university was, uh, was always, uh, relatively speaking, secure compared to anything else that you could have imagined over that period of time when you're associated with the mining business. Dysfunctional? No. I think, uh, you know, apart from the occasional tips and disagreements, uh, I, that's not been a feature at all. Been a very pleasant working environment. Yeah. What's your fondest memory that relates to your work? Oh. You know that should be a spontaneous answer. But, but yeah, you know, it, 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 it's always been the students. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, supervising uh, students. Uh, you know, I, I supervise fifty PhDs, for example. And yeah, I mean that that's been one of the highlights of the uh, of the career is the interaction with the students. Some of them were, were brilliant. I mean they really they would take me in directions that I didn't know I was going to go. And I really enjoyed that. I, I learned a lot from them. I, I hope and presume they learned a lot from me. So at the graduate level, the interaction with uh, with the graduate students, um, undergraduate school, yeah. Uh, but you know the, the classes got big. Uh, it was difficult to follow what was going on. Uh, Still bump into many students who, uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, that are all over the country here at this conference, for example. But I'd have to say it was it was really the research students that, that made the job a real challenge and a real pleasure uh, to to go through. That. And lots of different uh, topics we covered. And as I say, some of the students all were good. Some were just outstanding, and that that's always been a thrill to be able to be associated with that. And to sit while they're giving their PhD defense and know that they didn't just wow you, they, they wow the, the other people as well. So yeah, that's, it's good to be 
part of that. That, that was good. That was good. How present or absent were women in your workplace? Well, the I mean, it's always been a concern at the university in engineering that there are, there are never enough uh, women in there. Um, chemical engineering seemed to have resolved that. There were far more, it seemed, in chemical engineering, for example, than mechanical. I know you're asking specifically about mining and metallurgical engineering, but my sense is that there's always been quite a number. Uh, one, of the, one of the first papers I wrote was with uh, uh, Olga Makwajenko. I don't know where she is now, but uh, we did some work on grinding and mineral distributions and grinding circuits. Uh, I remember her very well. I don't think there were any other lady or girl students in the class at the time. But if you look at the progress over the years, there's always been uh, women in the group. Uh, certainly in the research group, there's always been. Always been. I think right now there's probably 40% are, uh, are women. And the undergraduate program has certainly had a steady uh, number of, of women in the, in, in the business. So I think mining and metallurgy might have been doing a little better than some of the other engineering disciplines, chemical engineering being the, uh, being the notable exception. So uh, I don't have statistics on that, it's just when I look around, I mean, well, there's been a, a steady number of, of women in the, uh, in the undergraduate program, and certainly in the graduate program, that was always true. How has your own work affected, uh, affected industry in Canada? How has my work affected your industry in Canada? The contributions that you made. Should ask other people, but uh, yeah, there, there are there are two there are two things that immediately come to mind as being things that probably are a good contribution in the sense that uh, I, I won awards for that work. Um, that was column flotation. Um, we resolved issues on on scale up and test work and. Um, we, uh, as I say, wrote, wrote a book, and it's still referred to. Um, and at least one company, actually more than one, used that information to become, uh, to, to sell and, and promote common foundation work. And they were Canadian companies, so I think uh, we, we can be quite, uh, quite proud of that. It's, uh, these these spin-offs are encouraged. It was never something that I set out deliberately to do. I, I'm not an entrepreneur, I'm not a businessman, uh, but was certainly glad to see that students were, <laughs> were willing to take that gamble and, uh, and, take, and take that the next step to, to, to uh, commercialise these ideas. And the other was to understand more in terms of the research level really, understand what was going on in these big tanks, these columns and, and mechanical cells where you're blowing air in and making one millimeter bubbles, swarms of them uh, in a slurry of uh, particles of less than 100 micrometers in a It's a very complex system. So, yeah, you could try to write down some mathematical equations, but we always felt that if we wanted to do something in terms of controlling the process, you've got to measure. You've got to measure. So, we developed a, a series of what we refer to as gas dispersion sensors. So, we would measure bubble size, we would measure the gas content in the cell develop sensors to do that, the gas velocities in the cell. So when you put that together, you could characterize the, generally people refer to it as hydrodynamics, it's more like aerohydrodynamics, because you've got water as well as air. And you could characterize these cells very well. And, and I see that still being, being referred to, still being used. People want to model or characterize, they will use these measurements and, you, and, and very often use the, the sensors that, uh, that we develop. And uh, so we, we, we won an award from the Metallurgical Society for, for that innovation. Uh, and that, that comes only if there's an industrial application and a, and a demonstrated industrial use of that. And I know at the time we got it, um, I don't care, but I'm pretty sure at the time we got it, we were only the second university to get that award. Um, most of the others, of course, are going to be from industrial groups that are, that are developing things and being used. So, yeah, I think we, we probably had, uh, we had an impact uh, from that. And from those measurements, uh, 
We learned a lot about the process that we've used in our uh, short course uh, seminars at McGill, short courses. And uh, I've been on the road many times giving courses and lectures uh, that uh, show what we've done and how you can use this information uh, for plant improvement. Yeah. What's you, what do you believe to be your biggest uh, contribution or accomplishment in, in the world of metallurgy? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, graduating 50 PhDs and 73 master's students. I mean, I, I long lost track of where they've all gone and what they're all doing, but uh, I can't but believe that they themselves have made an impact. So through me, I've had an impact way beyond what I would even uh, have the ability to keep track of. So I'll mention personally cold flotation and gas dispersion sensors, but you know, I think the big one is, is all those students that... Uh, that passed through uh, McGill and uh, worked with me and gone on to around the world. Yeah. Um, do you feel that the uh, relationship between academic uh, metallurgists and metallurgists working in industry has changed over time? I think it's changed. I think it's got a lot better. I think uh, uh, I think there's an appreciation on the industrial side that you know we have we may approach things differently, but we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to make improvements. Uh, we're trying to do it energy-wise, environmental-wise. Uh, yes, you know, we have to write academic papers that sometimes sound a little bit uh, diffuse from what the industry is, but that's part of our product. But uh, a big component of what we want to do is to, is to make improvements that reflect on, uh, on the way the industry uh, works. So, I said earlier on, I thought there was a level of suspicion. Suspicion is that they didn't feel we had much to contribute from a research side, always undergraduates, of course. I mean, we needed to do that. But I think that that's changed quite a lot over the last uh, 40 years. And um, we will be invited to, uh, you know, not just me, but I mean, metallurgists now, research metallurgists get invited to comment and contribute in industrial workshops. And um, I think that, uh, I think things are a lot better in terms of the two components we want to do, the industrial and academic side in metallurgy, I think there's a lot of synergy there. Yeah. How has the uh, proportion of industry sponsored research relative to say government sponsored research changed in Canada over time? Well when I started it was it was very modest and all government uh, and at different levels of government. There was some provincial funding um, and there was funding through the, uh, the mines branch, energy mines and EMI, energy mines or research, and resources. Um, to some extent, that money still exists, not the, not the mines branch money. Uh, but what did increase was substantially, in my view, the uh, funding from the federal government, from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, um, strategic grants. Uh, for me, the big ones, the CRDs. Now there was a vehicle by which we could uh, get industrial money matched, in so it doesn't necessarily like that word, but it's basically what it comes down to, match. Uh, and so both sides are encouraging the other side to get into the research business. Uh, there were some initial suspicions. I mean, companies would want to know why. <laughs> why do they want to put money in to help us um, develop a scale-up procedure for columns. What, what's in it for them? So well, what's in it for them is the fact that they are trying to promote research. And if you're going to put money in, they're going to help attract that money by putting their money in. So we want to increase the amount of research dollars that comes from industry. One way of doing it is to use federal money as, as, as seeds, as, as attractions. So that was a, was a, that was a, a real change for me in the, uh, in the environment in the, in, in the 80s, late 80s, just to, to notice, to, know, to take note of the fact that we could access this. And I got good industrial contacts at this point, partly because I've been working. I mean, the first group we worked with was Kaminka. I mean, I, I worked at Pine Point and, and I knew the people in the research groups of these companies, in particular Kaminka to begin with, and then, uh, and then Inco. Um, I knew the people there and, uh, you know, They'd seen me work, they trusted what I do, and now there was a vehicle by which we could actually uh, come together. Another vehicle which uh, started, and I was lucky enough to take advantage of, were these uh, research chairs. And uh, Enco approached me uh, in the early 
nineties, and, and we had a research chair with Inco. Although now it's got eight different companies associated with it, and it's another aspect of that collaborative research that uh, that the NSERP wanted to promote. And I uh, succeeded. It was a huge component of my research career was was being able to access those funds, and it was a lot easier to access those funds than my counterparts say in Australia mm. where this matching idea was was, was, was was less well developed. The Amira funding was Amira funding. It was not Amira funding to attract federal funding whereas here we did it with that mix and uh, that made life a lot easier. Uh, you weren't the industry would realise there was definitely a component of fundamental work that needed to be done here to satisfy the insert component of the money coming in. So you had this very nice blend. Fundamental work we wanted to do, practical work that we wanted to see come out of it as well. So not always an easy uh, thing to, to, to match or an easy thing to manage. But uh, that was part of that vehicle and uh, it, it worked uh, very well for us. Because I know in discussions with my Australian counterparts, they were much more constrained. It was, for example, difficult for them to get into column flow version because they didn't have a contract to work on it. And I said, well, you know, we started working on it because we had a little bit of money left over the year. We did enough to be able to find out it worked and then, then we looked for money. I found they seemed a bit more constrained on where they could just blue sky spend some money because it was a little more contractual uh, than, uh, than what we were dealing with in Canada. So I think that was a big plus for me and I think a big plus for Canadian research. What do you feel are the, are the biggest Canadian contributions to uh, metallurgy in your field? Oh, I, uh, oh, I'd like to get back on that. And what I would do is immediately go to uh, this book that was written, uh, the component uh, that I'm thinking of, uh, the 50th anniversary volume of the uh, Metallurgical Society. And that volume deliberately set out to identify what were the things over the last 50 years that Canada brought. Uh, so there's a long list in there and it would be a bit unfair to pick and choose right now. Um, I mean, things that are in there that relate to me, quant was in there, uh, these gas dispersion sensors are in there. Um, but there's much more. And so, I, I, yeah. I really would need a little bit of time to think about that, but uh, but that book is the source uh, of those. We've asked the same question as a society: What did we do? Mm. Uh, and in that sense, what did we do that had an impact on on, on the metallurgical business as a whole? Um, so I think I'll keep clear of that comment. I uh, I will I will miss some important ones that I don't intend. Okay. Who do you say was your greatest mentor or had the greatest impact in your life or career? Oh, Bill Williams. I mean, he was the one who wrote the. Um, sorry, he was the one who wrote the letter that, that, that attracted me to McGill in the first place. Um, he didn't always, and, and, and he watched what I did. Um, I don't, 100% sure why, and whether he took a particular interest. I don't think he had a particular interest in me over anybody else, but when uh, he noticed that I was publishing, uh, and then he had this opening in the in, in the department, uh, he, he offered me that job. So, um, oh yes, uh, a big influence. Um, at the next, well not the next, but another uh, contribution he made to my career, was helping me work out the details of getting this insert research chair. He was the chair of the department, so he's actually he's the one applying on your behalf. Of course, you were, and uh, he he guided me through all of the, the ropes on that. He he knew the systems much better than I did, and he was very good at uh, helping anybody. Uh, he saw his role as being the department. Say, you know, Bill Williams came second, the department came first. And so all of the people who worked in the department, he worked for them for their benefit. And uh, yeah, big, a big influence uh, uh, on, uh, on my career. And I was lucky enough in, uh, in two aspects. When he retired, they, I, they asked me to be the master of ceremony. So I thoroughly enjoyed being able to give back 
a little bit uh, of what I remembered and how we'd interacted uh, over the years. So it was, uh, it was a, a lot of fun. And we continued to work together after he, uh, after he retired. One of the things he set himself to do, he, whilst he was chair, and it was summer work. We're a co-op program now, but even before that, the students always had summer work, and that was one of his big tasks was to provide and find a summer work. Well, he found me, <laughs> he found me summer work. That was back in '74, as I said. And so when he retired, uh, he continued that work, and I became part of the committee uh, that helped him find these places. And uh, you can never say no to Bill. That was the other thing you learned. You know, he told you to do something, you better go and do it. Yeah, I think without a doubt, uh, in professionally. Biggest influence is, uh, is uh, the late Bill Williams. Yeah. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? <laughs> Never regret. There's always choices to make, and so uh, you make a choice, go for it, go as hard as you can, but don't look over your shoulders and wish you'd done something else. Now, that might be clear in the sense that everything seems to have worked out quite well, and I might be the first to say, yeah, it's been a very, uh, it's been a very um, satisfying career, but uh, I've always said that to myself, so I, I try to avoid looking back and wishing I'd done something else. So make a decision, go for it, and in a sense, live with the consequences, but, uh, but that's it. And I've followed these, followed these choices. You don't know which one's going to work out what. How it's going to work out, but uh, that's part of the uh, that's part of life, isn't it? You know, making choices and living with them. What are you proudest of in life? <laughs> oh, I'm very proud of the book that I've just finished. I kept saying to my wife, you know, that you'll be very proud of me when I finish this. And she said, "Well, I'm very proud of you right now." So uh, you can see where I'm coming from. I think very, very. Uh, Happy marriage. I mean, uh, been a fantastic uh, four years. She's, uh, I like to see, tell her she's American. She doesn't always go with that since she spent most of her life in Canada. But, uh, you know, I'm a guy from, from Birmingham. When I first met her, she was uh, from Dallas. I thought, yeah, this is, this is really great. And uh, we've had a wonderful time together and two, uh, two children. Um, yeah, you know, and so when it came to retirement, it was a, in a sense, a no brainer. I don't, need to be at the office to feel fulfilled. I'm quite happy to, uh, to, to do all the other things that, uh, that life's got. And right now, that's exactly what we're, uh, what we're doing. We sold the house, uh, bought a cottage, live on a lake next to a golf course, uh, join the, uh, the canoe club, the, uh, the singing club, the, uh, the bike club. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's great we have a wonderful time together. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's what I would pick. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview before you finish? Any, any information you'd like on the record? Do we get a chance to see what it is before <laughs> before it gets published? Or what? Where does it go it. from here? Um, I believe that it's edited and it'll end up on a website. Um, great deal of detail about it, but uh, I think that's the eventual plan is to put it on a website and I believe it says somewhere around here that you'll be contacted before that happens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of anything. I think we've covered an awful uh, yeah. lot of ground there. I mean, everything from where I went to primary school all the way, all the way up to retirement. That's a, that's a lifespan. No, I can't think of, uh, can't think of anything else. Can you? Uh, these are all the, uh, these are all the required questions. Has yeah. anything come up in previous interviews that you'd say, well, I wish they'd uh, included that as part of the questions? Well, I've often found that, I mean, every once in a while, I, I haven't done a lot of these, so you can chat with people after the interviews and they're, they tell you more interesting things than yeah. when the cameras are all in. Which is, yeah, I was trying to uh, ignore the ignore the, uh, ignore the camera there, yeah. And, you know, even if I've read these questions beforehand, it's... What am I going to do? Script it? No. Uh, yeah. So there's there's a certain um, reality in the spontaneous questions or spontaneous answers. Uh, thinking about them afterwards, you know, you try to put things in a certain order and make things flow in a particular way. But I mean, uh, 
that's not necessarily any more accurate than the spontaneous reflections that, uh, that, that, that you give. Yeah. One's as true as the other uh, when memory's involved. <laughs> mm -hmm.